Wow, 200 episodes. I'm not going to do the false humility who would have thought thing because of course I got to 200 episodes. I'm really good at this and I work really hard at it. But I am sincerely grateful for everyone that watches from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for your viewership and here's to another 200 to come. But for today and also for next week, let me show some gratitude by finally tackling an episode topic fans have been asking about for quite a while. Let's do the death of Superman. Okay, the main reason I resisted doing this for so long is it's been extensively covered elsewhere, but I was also reluctant because it's not really an exciting story, and I mean that on multiple levels. The death and subsequent return of Superman is a dumb story full of crappy characters embodying almost all the worst trends of dreadful 90s comics, and its behind-the-scenes history is just a long, drawn-out, coming-home-to-roost of stupid decisions and business practices the comics industry should have seen coming but somehow did not. To understand what happened here, you need to know some history, mainly the history of replacement hero storylines and the history of what was happening in the industry in the 90s. So, replacement hero stories are a time-honored trope of superhero comics wherein the main protagonist is replaced for a time in their role, with the expected eventuality typically being that they will return to that role and or be otherwise renewed by the end of the arc. Usually the point of such a story is to remind potentially overcomplacent readers why they liked the hero in the first place, and also sometimes to demonstrate why certain often asked for changes to a character's attitude or status quo might not be as good an idea as they seem. For example, the modern progenitor of such storylines came during Mark Grunwald's run on Captain America in the 80s. The US government wants Steve Rogers to do some missions he has ethical objections to. He refuses, so they strip him of his rank and title and give the Captain America identity to John Walker, formerly the amoral vigilante Super Patriot, a violent, nationalistic, America-lover-leave-it fanatic who'll do any sketchy mission this country tells him to. In other words, a caricature of the right-wing jingoist many people often assume Captain America to be or want him to be. Ultimately, Rogers adopts a new costumed identity, the Captain, uncovers a Red Skull conspiracy, and reclaims his title, with the alternate black costume passing to Walker, who reforms, sort of, into the superhero U.S. agent. This was also the case with Batman in the Nightfall storyline. The replacement Batman, John Paul Valley, a.k.a. Asriel, was, in personality and especially in design, a walking parody of obnoxious trends and superheroes that were taking shape at that moment put together to say one thing. Batman should not be like this. The death of Superman follows this same basic outline, but with four separate replacements, and no real point. It's a huge, elaborate narrative that was preceded by the most hype of any comic book release in history, played out over multiple books for dozens of issues, and shook the DC Universe in ways that have left a mark to this day, and it's about nothing. Superman gets killed by a boring brand new villain, gets replaced by four different guys, the real one comes back, and the closest the whole production comes to having something to say is, if Superman died, people would be sad. As to the state of the industry, well, we've touched on this a few times before, but basically comics turned into a much bigger business than they'd ever been. There were a lot of contributing factors, but one that inspired the truly epic bloating of the 90s was called the speculator boom. Basically, stories about the aging baby boomers finding old comics they'd saved from their childhood to be worth a fortune to collectors were a popular thing in the news media at the time, and comics became a hot item for investors. Comic publishers capitalized on this by making a lot more books, introducing a lot of poorly thought out new characters, and staging huge events like weddings and deaths constantly, directly intuiting that speculators would buy them by the truckload, remembering how much money first appearance and new status quo issues from the Gold and Silver Ages were selling for on market. And then they figured out too late that the reason old comics sold for so much was because no one thought they'd be worth anything and didn't save them, making them rare. But there were so many copies of these would-be investments being produced in the 90s that that would never be the case here, so the speculator market dried up and the industry deflated on itself. But, right in the midst of it, DC Comics decided they might as well publish the event to end all events and actually kill kill off the most beloved and well-known hero of all time whose entire being was built around the fantasy of invulnerability. And what story did they choose to tell for the death of the superhero? Something meaningful, something thoughtful, heroic self-sacrifice to rescue Lois Lane, final confrontation with Lex Luthor or Brainiac, preventing the Earth from the same fate that befell his homeworld of Krypton? Haha, <laughs> no. A really, really boring new villain we've never heard of before and wouldn't get a backstory on until much later named Doomsday shows up and they beat each other to death across the four concurrently published published Superman books, the last of which was comprised entirely of splash pages. No, really, that's the entire story of the death of Superman. And believe it or not, what happened after that was even dumber.
As we established previously, the best story DC Comics could apparently figure out to tell under a loaded title like The Death of Superman was A Big Monster Beat Him to Death. That was it. Kinda lame. Anyway, during this same period, DC had been publishing four separate Superman books. Superman, Superman the Man of Steel, The Adventures of Superman, and Action Comics. After the Death storyline concluded, all four books took a three-month hiatus, after which they were relaunched, but without the Superman people knew. Instead, each book kicked off a storyline featuring the mysterious appearance of one of four different new characters, each of whom claimed to either be or hold some philosophical right to being the Superman, together forming a single megastory called Reign of the Supermen, a reference to the Siegel and Schuster science fiction story that preceded their creation of the more familiar character. You can kind of see how this might have been an interesting idea. The inherent problem with doing a story about Superman dying is that nobody actually expects him to die or remain dead, so instead you make it a bigger story, maybe about exploring different facets or interpretations of the character over the years through the gimmick of the four Supermen, or at the very least using one or all of them as caricatures of modern superhero types to demonstrate why the original Superman still mattered. If nothing else, they could always have used them as ways to test new ideas people might have resisted if applied straight off to the original character. Unfortunately, none of that is what they did. Maybe though were ideas in the beginning, but what they ended up with was a curiously inert foursome, only one of whom was remotely interesting. That would be the Man of Steel, later just Steel, aka John Henry Irons, a construction worker whose life was once saved by Superman, and who wears a suit of armor and carries a hammer because folklore reference. As for the rest of them, there was the Man of Tomorrow, are we getting the Superman nicknames naming scheme yet, aka Cyborg Superman, aka Oh Hey Look a Terminator because 90s. The Metropolis Kid, supposedly a genetic clone of Superman who'd prefer not to be called Superboy because lol it's the 90s and how lame would that name still be? And finally, the last son of Krypton, who I guess is supposed to be Superman if he was more of an alien than a man and was willing to kill bad guys, which is at least an idea, I guess. The four of them each went through bisecting rain storylines, plus secondary plots about a Superman cult and the body being stolen, none of it particularly interesting. Long story short, Cyborg Superman was the bad guy, actually the new form of an earlier cybernetic villain, just not either of the famous and or interesting cybernetic villains, using the occasion of Superman's death to mess up his public image. Once again, this was apparently the best they could come up with for the comic book event of the decade. So that means The Last Son has to be the real Superman somehow reborn, right? Because otherwise, drawing the whole four guys who is it thing out only to have it turn out to not be any of them would feel like a giant pointless waste of time, right? Yeah, so it's not any of them. Not even Last Son. Turns out he's actually the Eradicator, who... Oh, dear lord, these characters. Okay, the Eradicator was a minor Superman foe from what was at the time a few years prior. Basically, he's a piece of alien technology that when sentient takes humanoid form and tries to turn wherever he is into an idealized version of ancient Krypton. Superman defeated it once before, but now it's back and was operating under the impression of actually having been the resurrected Superman. But it's not. It just unconsciously borrowed Superman's body to use as the heart of a regeneration matrix to power its own rebirth, because that's not convoluted. But the regeneration matrix has also revived and powered the real Superman, who emerges towards the end of the story without most of his powers and looking perfectly ridiculous. Good lord, really. This image was considered really, really cool at one point. Somehow. Anyway, Cyborg Superman's big plan is to help Mongol destroy the Earth by turning Green Lantern's hometown of Coast City into a gigantic engine, killing hundreds of thousands in a massacre so traumatic for Hal Jordan that it helps kick off the Parallax storyline we talked about back when it looked like we might all have to actually know and understand Green Lantern continuity. The good guys show up and fight the bad guys, Eradicator sacrifices himself to stop Superman from being killed by a kryptonite gas attack, and in doing so causes the attack to restore Superman to full power again. Sure. The bad guys lose, the good guys win, and Superman has a stupid mullet for a while. The whole thing didn't really have as many long-term intentional reverberations as you'd expect, outside of tying later storylines to the events in some way after the fact. Steel stuck around and remained a good character, and the new Superboy was eventually made interesting as well. Cyborg Superman keeps coming back for reasons I don't quite comprehend. As for Superman himself, the main lasting change was using his resurrection and repowering as an excuse to jettison the hard and fast limitations that had been placed on certain depictions of his power since the mid-80s, reverting him to a point where he can pretty much do whatever the story needs him to, like in the original version. The other lasting impact though, at least from where I sit, is that even though The Death of Superman stands up as a big, dumb, dated, not particularly great Superman story, it was still one of the biggest money-making hits in comics history, unquestionably helping to create more than any other story the event-oriented constant upheaval that defies DC and a lot of Marvel storytelling today. Also, most of the people at Warner Brothers, which then already owned DC Comics at the time, who were in charge of the DC movies then, still have a lot of power now, hence why they still regard this as being the big Superman event, and why they spent over a decade trying to turn a version of it into a movie, and why I won't be surprised at all if ideas from it find their way into the DC movies going forward. I mean, I hope not, but I won't be surprised. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. <laughs>